Good morning. My name is Joe Simperman. I'm the president of Global Cleveland, and I'm thrilled to have today uh, the honor of being uh, a participant, a witness to this great panel that's going to be closing up our welcoming week. Um, we were very intentional this year about making sure that we included the full scope of the international community here in Cleveland. And throughout the week, we've heard from different people from our Latinx community, we've heard from our healthcare community, uh, we've heard from our interfaith community, uh, representing the greatness that is Cleveland throughout. This week could not have been happening without the incredible hard work of some colleagues, and I just want to give them a quick shout out as this is our last official panel. I want to thank Nancy Janis, I want to thank Jenica Gonzalez, Michelle Carver, Supriya Tamang, Elizabeth Kuzma, Rosarita DeMillo, Esther Ngemba, and Colin Derrick for all the great work that they did. One of the things this panel made me promise was that even though this was gonna be the closing panel of Welcoming Week, that this conversation would continue. And so I give you my pledge that as we end Welcoming Week, we begin Welcoming Year and expect to hear more from the great people who participated this week. Thanks to our board. Thanks to everybody who makes this work possible. I'd like to introduce one of our phenomenal board members, Lisa Blanchard, who will be introducing this panel this morning. Thanks, everybody. Happy Welcoming Week. Thanks, Jill. It is absolutely my honor to be introducing this phenomenal panel today. So I thank all our guests who have joined us this morning. We welcome you. We're so grateful to have you here. I will just give you an introduction to our amazing panelists. I'll start with Esther. Esther Ngemba immigrated to the United States from the Democratic Republic of Congo after living in Uganda for five years as a refugee. She is currently a junior at John Carroll University studying international relations and peace, justice, and human rights. Esther holds a great passion for helping other refugees through her public speaking, advocacy work, presenting the Leave No One Behind event at UNG19 with Global Citizens. In addition to her advocacy, Esther is the founder of her own LLC called Furahi, A Taste of Home. She uses this opportunity to share her culture through cooking, and it's amazing, you have to see this. Kwame Botwe moved to the United States from Ghana, where he now works as a writer and urban development professional. His previous work experience spans academia, journalism, and corporate affairs in both Ghana and the United States. Currently, he works as a capital development and impact manager with a community development financial institution, Village Capital Corporation. Kwame is also founder and principal at Citadel Impact Consulting. He holds a Master of Science in Social Administration from Case Western Reserve, where he was awarded the Mandel Leadership Fellowship. What have I been doing with my life, right? Danielle Sidnor is the president of the Greater Cleveland Branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, also known as the NAACP. As president, Sidnor is responsible for fighting for the equality and rights of all people with a focus on eliminating racial, racial hatred and racial discrimination. She is also the founder and CEO of We Win Strategies Group, a firm dedicated to working with a diverse array of stakeholders to create win-win outcomes for individuals, organizations, and communities. Additionally, Daniel serves as president of the Board of Trustees at Eliza Bryan Village and second vice president of the National NWACP, Next Gen Alumni Council, and many, many other impactful leadership positions. Cecil Lipscomb is the executive director of the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Inc., UBF, where he was awarded the Smart Business 50 Innovation, Impact, and Sustainability Award in 2019. Mr. Lipscomb currently serves as first vice chair for the board of directors at Eliza Bryan Village, is on the Friends of Breakthrough Schools board, holds the co-chair of the Equity Leadership Council for the United Way of Greater Cleveland, as well as numerous additional leadership positions. So I thank all our panelists. It's going to be an amazing time, but we could not have had this panel and possible without the help of our sponsors. And I invite all our guests, we know you have a choice as to where you do business and who you support. So please remember as you're choosing what to do and where to support in the next upcoming weeks, be sure to think about our sponsors. Cleveland Cavaliers, Marcus Thomas, United Church of Christ, Northeast Ohio Relocation Guide, Cuyahoga County Board of Development Disabilities, Bank of America, De La Taya, Catanese Classics Seafood, Alexander Man Solutions, Eli's Landscaping and Design, Medical Mutual, 
International Law Section, Cleveland Metro Bar Association, the NRP Group Destination Cleveland, the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, Margaret Wong and Associates, Cuyahoga County, City of Cleveland, the Downtown Cleveland Alliance, WKYC Studios, Lucky's Market, and Days Market. So at this time, I will turn it over to our moderator, Mordecai Cargill. Take it away. Awesome. Um, or should I say dope? Um, I, I told Cecil that, um, you know, I was going to try to work it in as, <laughs> as smoothly as possible, but, um, you know, I, I just got a little carried away. Uh, what can I say? Um, good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to this virtual liberated space. Um, I'm, I'm so incredibly um, honored to have the privilege to be um, in conversation and in, in, in community um, with with some people that I, I really, frankly, just admire. You know, I I would do this, you know, any time of day. So, uh, without further ado, I just wanted to um, just unpack real quick uh, what what we mean by a liberated space because it's important for us to to just set that um, context, right? We usually do some agreements when we start these conversations, but um, given that that this topic itself. Um, thinking about advocacy, allyship, alliance, and like just thinking about what it would mean for there to be some solidarity across um, the the the, ve the vast range of identities and perspectives that are represented within the Black experience. Um, this is frank. This is really like family business, you know. And I told Joe um, when when we were preparing for this conversation that some of these ideas are things that that we often do not have enough time or space to to really unpack in great detail. So I wanted to just make this a liberated space, um, a space that upholds the values of caring, commitment, co compassion, and self-reflection. Um, a liberated space is discursive, creative, and even at times contentious, but it's, ne it's never combative or disrespectful. But also the most important element of a liberated space is that these are spaces that are fertile ground for celebration, freedom, love, and self-realization. Is everybody cool with this being a, a liberated space? Cool. Okay, so um, we're we're here to to really unpack the Black experience in a time of um, incredible uncertainty, um, and we're really trying to think about how we create solidarity um, across these these lines of difference. Um, even within the um, incredible complexity and diversity within the Black community, um, we know that there is some, some work for us to do to get on the same page. But um, one thing to, it's important to note that the Black experience is in some ways a story of migration in and of itself, of departures and arrivals. And so um, I wanted to, before we, we go too much further, I wanted to just start with a soul check um, Y'all know I always do these crazy like icebreakers. So today's question is, what is your soul singing? And then after you answer that question, um, I'd like you to reflect on these, this two-part prompt. First, what does it mean to be Black in America? And then what does it mean to be Black in Cleveland? Cool. So I'm going to start with my actual president, Miss um, Danielle Sidner. Um, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off. Thank you so much, uh, Mo. I call Mordecai Mo. So thanks, Mo, for um, just leading us off and starting us, you know, in an authentic way to create space for us to have the kind of conversation that we deserve to have with each other. Uh, what has my soul singing? I think it's uh, watching my kids, you know, during this moment and um, seeing how they're responding and reacting to navigating a pandemic plus also being young black men who are at, you know, at the center of everything that's happening in society around the, the discourse. And so seeing them kind of walk into their own voice as it relates to the platforms they choose to use for activism has my soul singing. Um, and I think in terms of the, the prompt of like what it means to be black in America and what it means to be black in Cleveland, I think what it means to be Black in America is that we have found um, somewhat a new set of 
partners and allies that we're really, I say, vetting to see how long they'll continue to stay in the struggle with us. What it means to be Black in Cleveland is somewhat um, bipolar, and I don't use the term lightly in terms of knowing that people really struggle with that as a, a mental health diagnosis, but I feel like we have significant challenges in what our city and our city leadership, and I say city broadly, thinking about the greater Cleveland community, espouses as a desire to create a space that's more inclusive and more welcoming. But there was an article that was released yesterday in Detroit News that we have now beat Detroit as becoming the largest uh, poorest city in the country. So I just feel like we say a lot, but the actions don't often match up. Right on. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, D Money. Uh, so we're going to have to un unpack uh, part of what you said, particularly about uh, what, it, what it means for the Black experience to be a, like a bipolar condition, right? Like how, how, do, we, how do we reconcile that? Um, but I want to go um, to Esther. Esther, if you wouldn't mind sharing uh, what, what's keeping your soul singing these days, and then what does it mean to be Black in America? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Mordecai. Uh, I think food right now keeps my soul singing. <laughs> I love food and family and just seeing people happy during this um, time because it's a very difficult time. Like, you know, just seeing people happy and just like enjoying life and taking care of their mental health. Uh, being Black in America and in Cleveland. Um, I think it's very, uh, I have mixed feeling like what Danielle said. It's bipolar because like there's so many things that, um, when as a black person you experience in America, because like for me migrating to the United States that I never thought I would experience. Like, you know, the United States back home is seen as this like great country, but like as a black person, when you come here, even just in Cleveland, I'm just gonna say in general, you experience all of this like racial tensions and you just realize how people view you and the low and all the barriers that you have um, to pass. And I'm like, we're in the 21st century and also as a college student, right? Now I'm facing so much, um, racial things in just the department. So like right now I'm just have like a mixed feeling about how it means to be black in America. So but I enjoy being black. Like I love Beyonce's new song. So like, you know, that keeps me going. <laughs> right on, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Cecil, um, Mr. Lipscomb, would you mind uh, weighing in on the, on the two part prompt? Uh, oh, I thought you were saying two part. I'm sorry. My, my apologies. <laughs> The um at the end of the day, Mr. Lipscomb is my father, so I really appreciate <laughs> that. And I know I'm old, but I'm not that old, Mordecai. The um so what has my soul singing this morning? I uh in my little quiet time, you know, reading the word, and there was a scripture that jumped out. It was talk, talked about people being stirred up, mm -hmm. stirred mm -hmm. up for a moment, and uh, I think we're there, you know. So in the old days in America, people would sing in the, in the sweet by and by, talking about a later afterlife. Mm -hmm. um, but I think where we are in, uh, now, that has me excited when, when you talk about stirring the soul up, it's about what we can accomplish here mm -hmm. and now mm -hmm. at the sweet by and by. So I, I love the, the fact that people are stirred up, whether it be good, bad, or ugly, people are stirred up. And so uh, in terms of being black in America, I, I, I think it's no different from Cleveland. Mm -hmm. uh, people relegate themselves to pockets, mm -hmm. pockets of comfort. Mm -hmm. And it's probably uh, natural, uh, but what happens is the infusion of uh, the bad parts of human nature get mm -hmm. kind of mixed in, mm -hmm. and, and, and there is a a fight for scarce resources. There's a fight for superiority. There's a fight for um, uh, positioning. Um, and you can look at America, you can look at Cleveland in the same way. Uh, so I, I don't have any distinct differences between the two. Mm -hmm. I think that there are tremendous opportunities for us. And I love to, you know, as a as an immigrant nation, um, mm -hmm. that, that's primarily a conversation I'd like to talk about. And, and I'm not confusing slavery with immigration. I, I let's get that out the way. Right. Uh, so so um, I can't wait to unpack some of what you have today. Oh, sure. Sure, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and Kwame, 
you have the the final word on this round and uh if you can work uh dope into your reflections you get an extra point so no pressure awesome um thank you thank you mordecai so <laughs> Um, two things have my soul singing. Um, one is that over the last couple of days, I took the time to um, try to compile all the poetry that I've written over the last decade or so. And I noticed that I've actually in my poetry reflected a lot on the Black condition, um, whether it was here in the United States or back home in Ghana, where we also still had to deal with um, some of the effects and the legacy of colonization and the neocolonialism that is going on now. Um, and so reflecting on all of those things and seeing that in my writings over the time um, have, you know, given me some comfort that I've not drifted um, away from the course. Um, that is one. And the second is having this conversation this morning. Um, I think these are the kind of conversations that we should be having as a community. So um, the fact that we are having this con um, conversation and I've heard or listen to several others that have happened over the course of time, especially this year, um, since all the protests that have happened, both of those things um, have made uh, my soul sing um, different tunes. Um, as far as being Black in America is concerned, quite honestly, I have often uh, sort of questioned myself mm -hmm. whether I was actually really Black or I was just African, mm -hmm. uh, because that is something that I've had to um, reckon with. Mm -hmm. and wrestle with over the three years that I've been here of, am I black enough mm -hmm. you know, to be in some of the spaces that I was being in? And given that I came through, I came here to go to school, completed and wanted to work in the city and commit my um, time, resources and intellect to the city and having to um, actually do the racial equity work and be in these spaces that are having these conversations and devote my scholarship to that as well. I've often been confronted with the question of, are you black enough to be doing the racial equity work here in America? Um, that is one of the things. Um, the other thing is, you know, just all the stereotypes that we carry around. So sometimes you feel like you are the epitome of um, all the Hollywood caricatures um, from coming to America to, you know, some of these other things. And quite honestly, I enjoy um, running into young, um, you know, children sometimes and they see me and they're like, Wakanda forever. And I, you know, reciprocate. Um, so that has been a fun part of um, the identity, but there's a lot of other things that are packed into that, where sometimes people look at you as opportunity thieves, um, coming here and stealing opportunity from your fellow Black people. So that is also something that you've had to reckon with. So on the flip side of that, also dealing with the actual racism um, that is institutionalized in the country. So those are some of the um, you know, things about being Black in America that you know, we've um, all have to, had to reckon with. Yeah, man, Kwame, you, you just you just said so much and 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 so eloquently. I mean, uh, that that is really kind of the the crux of uh, what feels like a cultural divide, even within a within a racial group, right? Like there there is so many ways. There are so many ways that like we are facing together a common experience of this like kind of double and in, in some ways triple and layered levels of being othered within the society broadly, but then also like needing to defend your right to, to, to be within a community, right? Mm -hmm. And then there, there, are, there are so many other ways of looking at um, what oppression is. And you know, the black experience is not all about oppression, but one of the, the critical like analytical frames that we, we depend on is having an intersectional understanding of like what's happening to us like how do we understand our positionality within society right based off of our multiple identities so i'm, I'm curious um danielle and and cecil um your your reactions to to what kwame just said you know like like what what does that what does that feel like to 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 hear him reflect on that no, Mo, I think that the, the thing that um, I think about first when I hear that is as a light-skinned mm -hmm. uh, African-American that I sometimes am defending Blackness as well. And so it's very interesting that what caused us to even have this term subjected to us at all was the color of our skin, right? And so uh, 
Kwame would more naturally identify based on the term itself as like black. And he has to, to struggle and grapple with like, am I black enough? Am I the right kind of black? Mm -hmm. And someone who is of two parents who are African-American, but obviously some sort of, um, you know, change in the DNA over time, mm -hmm. um, it deals with that same sort of, you know, challenge of being in spaces and explaining like, no, I'm not mixed, whatever mixed might mean to, to somebody else. Most of my parents are quote unquote black. Mm -hmm. um, and just knowing that it's not really our skin anymore that defines mm -hmm. us. It's mm -hmm. sometimes the perceived culture that we bring to the table or the set of life experiences that we bring to the table. And then also helping to try and, and convince people that we're not a monolith. And right. so the black experience isn't a person that just grew up in poverty or a person that was just from you know the continent or a person that's just from here. And so it's very interesting to me that um, in this space that in 2020, as we look at going into the future, how little advancement that we have had around Th this term black and what it actually means and who gets to define it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, well said, Danielle and Kwame, I appreciate your statements and, and uh, Mordecai, you hit on, you know, like what's the shared cross section of understanding. So like in Africa, you don't have to say it, right? Everybody is, right? The majority of folks are. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not necessary. So you identify with tribe and you identify with nationhood just like most um, uh, parts of the world. And, and uh, so to come here and have to be identified and categorized in a particular way, most of our brothers and sisters are like, what? Even coming in from South America, uh, Afro uh, folks from uh, the Caribbean, it's, it's natural to say, all right, well, what are you? Well, I'm Dominican, I'm, I'm Haitian, I'm, you know, I'm American, right? And, and so now to have a construct impose itself on you to make you identify yourself in a particular way based on its historical uh, background is, is just an adjustment, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the fact that you reference neocolonialism and colonialism, uh, uh, it's no different than what we experience here. It's just within one nation. Uh, so when you, when you look at the, the outcomes of what colonialism did, um, the identification and categorization of people in Brazil, just like in Africa. It's like, okay, we just, what's the guy that, that uh, the hotel manager for the Hotel Rwanda was just captured and sent back home or stolen and sent back home, uh, tricked to come back into his nation. And that's Hutu versus Tutsi, you know, and, and so you, you can call that black, black crime if you want, but there's an invisible hand Mm -hmm. that's facilitating the empowerment of one group over another. And, and so in America, you might not be able to identify what that invisible hand is mm -hmm. uh, because it's a different construct. Mm -hmm. But the more exposure we can share with one another on how there is a shared experience under, uh, under a, a different veil, mm -hmm. uh, we can, can better address uh, a, a diaspora, as a diaspora of people, mm -hmm. uh, how to impact the ills of, of what we would call racism and uh, segregation and all the things that make us less human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you, I, I want to just like build on, um, on uh, the, some terminology you just used, right? The, the idea of, of race as a construct. And, you know, it is, it is, so bizarre, right? Like that that's the one thing about about race and about like this structure, this this the social hierarchies that are aligned with race, right? The significance that our society has given race. And it, it actually goes back to to uh, Danielle's like kind of framing about like it kind of making you bipolar, you know, or the, or the experience being connected to this sense of like, this is all crazy, right? Like it's super disorienting. I can only imagine what it's like to, to come from a, like a, a black world or a black, like, you know, uh, nation, right? So my, my, my own father, my, my father's from, from Jamaica, right? And my dad came to, to uh, the United States um, to go to Howard University, right? And Howard becomes this melting pot of blackness. You see the whole tapestry of the community 
represented on this campus. And, and you know, a lot of uh, like writers and academics have, have talked at, at length about the value of being in that like multicultural black world, you know. Um, but there is also the, uh, the, what's really disorienting about the idea of race is that it's, it is only partly about how you feel and how you identify, right? Because so much of race is about how the world sees you and about the, the, the implications of what it means to look black in a white society, right? That, that devalues blackness. So I, I guess I'm, I'm really curious, um, Kwame and, uh, and Esther, um, what, was there a moment or were there some experiences, some like, you know, um, like kind of formative experiences that, that told you that you were black in, the, in this society? Or is it something that, you know, you like kind of intellectually or even intuitively were anticipating coming to the States? Um, I think no. For me, I think I've always known that we I'm black. Going from the continent, okay. Um, back home, we have a bleaching issue. Like mm -hmm. when women bleach their skin to become over lighter complexion, because like, you know, with colonialism, if you're lighter, you're better. Mm -hmm. So like, I think at a very young age, like you know, I always like questioned that when I was little. But then also like I always knew like you know my mom told us like you know no bleaching like that's like bad for your skin. But then also like love your black skin like you know. So coming yeah. into America and just like seeing all like you know I was already like kind of like um, exposed to colorism. So mm -hmm. coming here it was kind of like and uh, saying okay I'm black and I love my skin tone and that's mm -hmm. who I am. Mm -hmm. But then also I think at some point for me when I really realized wow, black people are really treated different in America than other people. When I was going for my high school interview, I was interviewing to go to this private um, school and the lady, the way she was treating the other white students and the way she treated me, it was different. And I was like, what's going on here? And when she had me speak, she was like, oh, you're from the continent. You're like not African-American. And she was excited to talk to me. And I got really offended by that. And I'm like, you know, that's when it really kind of like reminded me that, wow, people will view you different if you're black. And when you open your mouth, like, you know, they view you different when you're African. So now I finally understood when African-Americans like say, you're kind of like stealing opportunities from us. And like, you know, when they make those side comments, cause I'm like, I'm getting sometimes some people will treat me different when they hear my accent because they know I'm not African-American. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when, it really like got into me like you really have opportunity in this space to educate that person who is doing that i told totally, like that's not okay like you know you shouldn't do that to anybody so like i have always identified as black i don't know because i came i came here when i was 12 so i've experienced a lot of recitations and i've always like always speak, uh, spoken up but then also like knew that even with my accent i still like get like um discrimination also from like the black community because like they will say those stuff also but like also learning how to like educate each other understand each other and also understand at the end of the day we are all black and this system was kind of like created so we have tension against each other and we have to find a way where we connect as one yeah yeah right on right on Connie, did you want to build on that yes i do i do want to um, build on that and uh, i've often heard uh, i've often heard people say when africans come here they come with um, sort of a framing of confidence in their own blackness. And sometimes I've had to push against that. Um, growing up in Ghana, the reclaiming of my identity as a black person, as an African, was a very intentional, deliberate and conscious work that I've had to do. Um, because I went through Catholic school all throughout. And very early on, as early as kindergarten, we were being presented with Catholic literature that portrayed Jesus as a white man and the devil as a black man, which was sort of part of the beginning of that mental colonization. And so going through that and coming into a place where you have become an adult and you're engaging in conversations, you hear people make comments in the media and school in churches where maybe somebody drops a trash on the floor and they'll be like, yeah, only black people do this. Like the white man wouldn't do this. Somebody is late to a meeting and they're like, yeah, the white man doesn't do this. That's why they are all ahead of you. So constantly you are hearing these narratives um, that are telling you that you are inferior to the white person. 
And so even growing up in Ghana and dealing with that and knowing that the school curriculum, for instance, that we are still using in Ghana today is based on the colonial curriculum that was developed. You know, so part of the work to actually identify as a black person and own it and claim it and be proud of your Africanness, I've had to do very consciously when I got to college, for instance. And that came from sometimes reading literature by African Americans who have had to deal with this more directly than I have had to. And so for me, the fight started more mentally and psychologically before it became more physical and felt, you know? So in Ghana, I've had to like do that work mentally. When I came to America, it has become even more tangible that you have to protect your identity and you have to um, actually hold on to it um, because it's so easy to lose it because a lot of guys that are coming here, we are so eager to fit in that we are shedding parts of our own identity in order to become um, you know, something that society would accept, whether it's acceptance by like the white community or it's acceptance by the African um, American community, we've had to shed um, part of our own identities in order to make that happen. And so it's been a very intentional and deliberate work. And I always encourage a lot of like my other African friends um, to do the same. And I do that through like the, the stuff that I write and through conversations and all of those. So um, I, I think there's a lot of like intentionality that has to come with that. Wow. Uh, again, an another another very deep, deep and, and very um, challenging idea, Kwame. Um, you know, I was just thinking about uh, this this thing that, that that James Baldwin would say about the the price of the ticket, right? It's like, in, to some extent, like your acceptance, your inclusion into the places where you want to be included. Sometimes, like the notion of what success looks like requires you to leave some of yourself behind, right? Yes, and precisely. It's, it's so, um, I mean, it, again, it goes back to that uh, disorientation or like the, the mental cost that this, um, these constructs impose on us, right? Now, I'm, I'm really curious, like, you know, uh, I, I think that, that one of the essential, um, like kind of opportunities in this type of conversation is like the understanding and awareness across differences, right? Across these national lines, right? I'm thinking about like the significance of colonialism on the continent and the, the intransigence and significance of structural racism within the American context. Like these are both like these, uh, systems of oppression right and exploitation that are you know basically related you know like one is probably the father well i mean colonialism is the progenitor to american structural racism right but like what what most black americans i'm i'm i guess i'm not sure if that's totally fair but i'm i'm sure that a lot of black americans don't understand the, the significance of that context right or how similar colonialism is to like structural racism that's that is my kind of hypothesis and i know that i had to to become an african-american studies major to have like a real deep and nuanced understanding of colonialism so i can only imagine because we weren't ta really taught about the the you know the negative aspects of colonialism right in in um, most of our educations right that most people lack that frame of reference so i'm, I'm curious uh danielle cecil like, how, how does that strike you? Like, what, what, what do you make of uh, that connection? So I'm all about uh, to, oh, are you going? Yeah, okay. Look, I took off a mute first, that way I, I can dive in, because I, I was ready, I was ready. Um, but, you know, I, I'm about to say something that might meet, may not get me invited back by Joe and Global Cleveland and the rest of the philanthropic community, but it's okay, I love you guys anyway. Um, you know, the, the, what Kwame just talked about is like the, the Catholic experience and the Catholic education that he received and the predominant agencies that bring Africans here and socialize them when they first get to Cleveland is the Catholic community. And so this, this kind of context of colonialism that is experienced on the continent gets replicated here. And I had this conversation with um, Esther's uh, brother de Gaulle about how there's all of these Africans in Cleveland and the black community doesn't know it. 
but that's part of how they're socialized when they get here and told to stay away from certain parts of the community and told not to do certain things. And so for everybody that's listening, hopefully somebody from any of the agencies that's helping to socialize and bring folks to Cleveland, you got to do better. There's no reason that they're not getting integrated with United Black Fund and NAACP and Urban League and the President's Council and, you know, all of these other organizations that can also help to quickly connect and understand and bridge that divide between the African experience and the Black in America experience uh, because it, it helps to reinforce these same stereotypes and issues. And I think as a, as a cohort of leaders, we have to do better. We have to take ownership for the fact that we continue to perpetuate these issues that were built into systems. And I, I think that that's something that really was illuminated for me when I met De Gaulle is that I had no idea the number. I mean, I knew the significant like Nigerian community. That's some uh, somewhat of a different experience than some mm -hmm. of our brothers and sisters who are coming over here through a refugee experience mm -hmm. and who have had trial and tribulation mm -hmm. and suffering to just get here and then come and are still isolated from like the rest of the population, mm -hmm. but will be treated just like you and I when it comes to it. So they need to be able to be socialized with our experience as well. So I just think that uh, hearing him say like, it started for me at, in, in elementary school, I'm learning, you know, this context and then to get here and have it reinforced even more. I just think we've got to work on how we as a community as well, hold these organizations that mm -hmm. are helping to bring, I've talked about, it's our family, our right. family here um, right. to make sure they're also socialized and brought into the family very early on. Right on, right on. So um, Kwame uh, mentioned when we were doing some of our prep conversations that his host family was pretty influential in um, engaging with him. And I think it's really important to give him and, and others the experience of uh, new knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and when I say the experience, he talked about staying out late in a particular part of town, just even day-to-day -day life on how to navigate. Um, and that coming from a lens, we all have to kind of remember our lens, you know, like even as black Americans, you know, I'm middle class. Mm -hmm. my, my great grandfather was middle class. Like th th that's a different lens. Mm -hmm. And then so when you talk about um, the, the economics of it, mm -hmm. we have to understand that like we, I think Danielle, you referenced Nigeria. So roughly about a $280 million economy, I think the largest in Africa, but it's based on oil and, and, and we're, we're kind of fueling that as, you know, all the gas cars we drive and the machines we have, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then the 62% of Nigerians are in extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like can't afford, like a, a statistic came out, can't afford a, a bar of soap level of extreme poverty, 62%. So now you look at America and the lens that we have as black folks mm -hmm. saying, okay, 13%, 14% of general population is uh, experiencing poverty. And then, uh, you know, maybe the number jumps, jumps up to 20, 25% in the African-American communities in general, mm -hmm. uh, double that of our white counterparts. So, so that's a lens a, uh, that we have to approach it. But I never overlook the economics of the situation. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the white lion, that slave ship that was captured off the coast of Virginia uh, and brought the first slaves to, to the coast mm -hmm. was headed to Veracruz mm -hmm. to find for gold. Okay, this was a business from the, from the giddy up mm -hmm. and it's still a business. And so mm -hmm. we have to, as a community, uh, introduce that understanding into America Mm -hmm. as, as, to why, as to the African-American experience for Africans and, and, and uh, brothers and sisters coming from all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the underlying notion is advancement of uh, the economy mm -hmm. and, and then how you approach your own individual endeavors to mm -hmm. achieve success, whatever that may be for yourself and your family, uh, has to be navigated with full information. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have that full information, you're going to make some missteps that unfortunately without a safety net, um, it could be detrimental, mm -hmm. like one hit wonder. So <laughs> my mom, I, I'll say, I'll, I'll end with this. My mom said the other day, uh, we, my, my, my great uncle, 
his, his name was uh, Roscoe Williams. This guy was just dashing. Yeah. Six foot three, kept the pocket full of money. And anybody in our family, if you came on hard times, you could go to him, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. could go to him. And, but you had an account with him. Like once you used up your hundred, you got to <laughs> replenish that. <laughs> don't say you're going to get it back to him and you don't get it back, right? <laughs> And then you can always go get your hundred if you fall on hard times. Mm -hmm. Folks coming from around the world, my mom, my mom has adopted that for everybody in my family, by the way. I don't know what the number <laughs> is, but thank goodness I haven't had to ask for it. But, yeah. but at the end of the day, if you don't have that extra support system, if you come from a situation with extreme poverty as your background and you're left to fend for yourself, it's a long road to uh, tow. Let's just say it that way. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, you know, one one of the things that, that uh, both you and, and Danielle just made me think of is like the the importance of community as a as an idea, right? Um, as a, a type of consciousness, but then also like the the actual literal community, right? So uh, so what what's really dope about this this collection of people? about the, the work that each of you are doing is like, you all have invested so much in like the work of making our community stronger, more connected, right? And, but, but one thing I wanted to, to emphasize is um, one, the, the, the importance of uh, black institutions, right? And what it, what it means to support and to lead a black institution and the, uh, the, the urgency of our community rallying its support around ensuring that these institutions continue to exist and can re-envision what they should be for the 20th, 21st century and, and even beyond that. The, the, the other is like, as, as we think about Cleveland, we think about when, you know, my, my grandparents, for, for instance, came up from from Arkansas, and they were they were looking for opportunities. People who came before them were were fleeing racial terrorism, right? And they came to Cleveland for sanctuary, right? That's a, that's another type of experience, another type of commonality that connects the past to to the present moment, right? And thinking about how the Black community has evolved, like over time, right? How how people have have left these like kind of um, historic black neighborhoods and have moved out to the suburbs. And now we're seeing a, a wave of like, you know, returning back to the urban environments, right? In Glenville, um, in Midtown, Huff, Fairfax, right? Like how, how, how might those two things over, like be, how might they intersect rather, right? So like, how, how can we do both of those things at once? How do we like continue to foster a sense of community and the connection to Black communities, but then also use our connectivity to one another to support these Black institutions. Does that question make sense? It does. Um, I'll, I'll give it a shout real quick. Um, I think me appreciating my brothers and sisters, like Esther, I did not know you had a cooking program and, and you can cook. I want to try that, like literally, like try that. And, uh, so, so we, we see the beauty in the diversity of our community. Um, I, I can appreciate coming from the East Coast, I grew up on the East Coast, and um, having come to Cleveland and seeing pockets of the city where you can come in and immerse yourself in the culture. I love it, okay? And, um, but it's when you don't appreciate the beauty and you see it as a uh, hindrance to progress to the region and you suppress it, that's the real issue. Mm -hmm. So I think internally um, investing in our own uh, uh, selves mm -hmm. to support one another is obvious, mm -hmm. like, like it's obvious. But one of the contexts of this uh, panel discussion was allyship. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's some folks associated with Global Cleveland, board members and, 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 and fund, uh, fund supporters, uh, philanthropists, mm -hmm. you, you get that vision, right? To, to, to fuel it with mm -hmm. time, talent, and treasure mm -hmm. and support, not supplant the institutions mm -hmm. like those legacy mm -hmm. groups that you talked about. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with Danielle's point. 
like if the Catholic Church has been a consistent engine of reaching across borders, mm -hmm. um, then in this time, we should see the value, like I should reach them, right? I should contact them, which I have, right? Mm -hmm. And But then there also should be like a realignment mm -hmm. of how we are engaging one another out of trust. So mm -hmm. it has to be an established commitment based on that trust to um, to support the community. So instead of driving past it or building highways to go over it, right. like right. let's nurture the opportunities that we have. Now, the last thing I'll say is, um, in terms of um, everyone living in the community, it's not going to happen, right? It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But you have to appreciate your neighbor, regardless of whether they're white, Hispanic, uh, 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 Asian, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And and that is America. That's the new place that we live in. So as much as we have um, beautiful, uh, culturally specific communities, we also can't fear our neighbor looking different than us mm -hmm. or voting different than us, dare I say. We mm -hmm. can't fear um, the fact that the, the, uh, you might see me as a particular person, mm -hmm. but you don't know my background, right? Like, so <laughs> we'll, get in, we'll get a little bit into that, but I, I just um, I just think it's reaching out to one another and supporting um, the efforts that we say we love. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Cecil. Um, any anybody I'd else? I'd like to chime in real quick. So oh, I agree with um, everything that both Cecil and um, Danielle have have said, and um, I do think that there's a lot of value in having strong organizations that are conscious and are supporting um, efforts to like build bridges. Mm -hmm. um, because I know that NWACP, for instance, um, has you know, definitely sent lots of delegations to Ghana. Um, last year, during the year of return, that has catalyzed a lot of investments and sharing of um, resources mm -hmm. um, and talent and expertise and all of those. And so organizations like that become incredibly important when we are thinking about how to deal with some of the miseducation that we have within the community. Um, I read something that someone said somewhere that the darkest thing about America, the darkest thing about Africa, for instance, is America's ignorance of it. And I can say the reverse is true um, for Africans as well, where the darkest thing about like African-Americans is our ignorance of African-Americans. And so in terms of doing that education and you know, tearing the flap off our eyes and all of those, mm. institutions become extremely important. Mm. Um, and you know, so that's why like what Global Cleveland is doing with this panel, for instance, it's mm. something that is needed. Mm -hmm. you know? And so these conversations, this sharing, you know, getting to know each other, supporting each other, all of these things come to play and are incredibly important if we are to make progress as one community of black people or Africans or however you want to like. Um, identify ourselves. Right on, right on. Can I add on something? Please. Going on, yeah, Danny's point about like um, the agencies also mean people are going to be mad about what I was going to say, but I honestly don't care. There's something me and Maya have been saying. They do disconnect us from the Black community. Because like one of the things that I already say, we go into these programs, like leadership program, like I love white people, I love everything, but why am I getting a white mentor instead of getting a black mentor when there are mm. so many amazing black mentors out here? And the reason why I say it, like, I have been going, I've been here since I was in elementary school mm. and I've been to college here. There is something that you get from a black mentor that you'll never get from a white mentor, especially as an African. Because yeah. there's some things that I wish I knew going in that would have encouraged me that some of those mentors will not have given me. Mm. And, um, Putting in like just like Africans' mind. That's what I'm saying. Like they're uh, they're not intentionally doing it, but they're creating systems of like racial and neo-colonialism, where they're separating Africans who are already here and African Americans, kind of saying we're against each other. And that's something that these agencies, I feel like, they really, really need to work on. It's a big issue, and we're seeing like the wrap of it, and it's not being good. So like that's one of the things I'll say. Like just like please work on that. Right on. Mo can, Mo, can I react to something she just said? Um, because I think that, and I think that I, I like the way that Cecil described, like we're not all going to live in the same community. Mm -hmm. And part of that construct initially was like, 
it was ordered to be that way, right? Mm -hmm. Like you were forced to live among certain people. You didn't have the freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. And so now that we do have the freedom of choice, if I decide I want to live in a place that has a lot more land away from people, mm -hmm. I can choose to do that. If I want to be an urbanite who wants to walk, I should have the freedom to do that. And so the construct of like everybody in my neighborhood looking like me or having the same shared lived experience as me, um, shouldn't be the ultimate goal, but it should be knowing that we have these spaces where I can, I can still freely be myself among whomever is there. And I think to Esther's point about the agencies and, and doing that work, I talk a lot about the fact that there's a lot of value in, um, as you know, Africans that are coming here or anybody, to have an integrated experience, right? Because that is the world. And mm -hmm. so being sure that yes, like give Esther a white mentor, but give her a black one too. Right. All right. So it doesn't, it's not, it's not a limiting, it's not like a, you know, if this, then that it's like, we can and should do both because a lot of her life experience in America is going to be interacting with white folks. So she needs to be socialized and have that experience too, but please don't rob her of having the experience to sit at the feet and the table with Danielle and Cecil, because to your point, those are some shared life experiences. And then we've got people like Michael Obi. We have other Africans who have come here who could also talk about the like, what it was like for me being an African coming to America, and mm -hmm. I can tell you the struggles that I've had or the the issues of how I've bridged the divide between the uh, Black American experience and the African in America experience. And so there's got to be a higher level of intentionality about how we create these bridges to ensure that as folks get here, they're able to thrive um, and not have to deal with as many barriers. So, Mordecai, you, you, you got us going now. Um, I, I got to say we something. We have about 10 minutes left. You got us going. Sorry. The, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, my, my, uh, my, I'm, I'm like second generation nonprofit, if, if that's a thing, right? <laughs> my, my, uh, my mother worked for an uh, organization called Christian Children's Fund, mm -hmm. right? And that was the, the, if you remember the commercials, they had, you know, starving children in Africa and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. views on TV. Um, she was an accountant, uh, but, but you know, those people that came to America would come and stay with us, uh, Africans. So I, I grew up like just with that structural nonprofit uh, approach, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also having uh, people from the Ivory Coast come and stay and sit in my house. And, and, and then my family uh, actually going to do uh, work uh, on the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but at the same time, my grandfather on my father's side, which my, my father, for example, his son is the same complexion as, as, as Kwame, right? Mm -hmm. And, but, mm -hmm. but his father was mulatto and, and uh, had to actually go by himself to purchase the home in the neighborhood where mm -hmm. he wanted to take his family, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because it was uh, something on the deed that said you couldn't sell to uh, certain groups of people, right. Right? Right, right, right? And out of that neighborhood, out of that neighborhood came uh, Randall Robinson, okay, uh, who, who was Pan-Africanist. Uh, mm -hmm. Max Robinson was the first black anchor, mm -hmm. uh, the first black governor, uh, uh, Governor Wilder, all out of that neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? So when we break into certain uh, groups, uh, or places mm -hmm. leveraging what we know how to navigate the American experience mm -hmm. mm -hmm. opens up the door, but we have to understand and be sophisticated um, to uh, approach success. And mm -hmm. it could just simply be as selfish as I want a good house for my family, right? right? right. And, and there is no obligation uh, beyond that for an average person. You know, you want to take care of your family. Mm -hmm. But then once you've attained a certain level of success, mm -hmm. you should always be thinking about how, how did I do this? What was my roadmap so that I can share it with others, right? Mm -hmm. what, so then you have something to share on how you were able to achieve a certain level of uh, success. Not everybody's called to this nonprofit mm -hmm. work, mm -hmm. right? But there is an option for, uh, for everyone to get involved and engage one another in the community. So thank you. Thank you for letting me jump in, brother. No, no doubt, no doubt. That was that was perfect, and and you know, I, I think because we're we're getting short on time, um, I, I just want to uh, again thank you, thank you all for your incredible like insights, your just general brilliance. Uh, again, I can't stress enough 
just how uh, how important this conversation is. And uh, I'm glad that Joe said that um, there's going to be more opportunities to continue this. But like, I, I think um, this is a conversation that, that doesn't have to wait for the next uh, welcoming week, right? Like we need to be having more of these conversations in spaces because I very much believe that uh, part of being able to create the city of Cleveland that we imagine in order to clarify our, our collective vision for the new Wakanda, that's my vision, but new Wakanda uh, as, a, as another idea. Uh, in, in order for us to, to, to really crystallize that vision for a better version of ourselves, um, I think it does require us to be in these spaces together, to be building community in literal ways and in more like kind of you know metaphysical ways but um you know the 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 only theme that i would have added to the title um of of this panel is uh is action right and perhaps naturally i'm inclined to say action is important but um i wanted to just close this out by giving you all like a final final opportunity to reflect like what kind of action is needed in this moment and like how how might uh establishing solidarity uh, between Black Americans, Native Black Americans, and Black immigrants, and you know those two communities coalescing and continuing to work through what solidarity looks like. How might that advance the type of action our community needs? So maybe I'll start with Kwame because you went last first time. First yes. Time. So um, just a quick shout out to all my African American people who have like really helped me in my growth in this regard. So Dr. Mark Joseph at Case and Milani Joseph and um, Professor Barbara and my partner who has um, implored me to read more books written by Black women. So that is part of my journey that I'm embarking on going forward. Um, as far as the way forward is concerned, I have a couple of things in mind. One is that I do think there should be um, definitely more education so we can begin to shift our mental models. Um, as far as how we look at each other is concerned. Secondly, is that I think there should definitely be more cultural sharing and exchange. So um, we all need to visit Esther sometime and eat some of her, um, you know, cook, you know, food, Congolese food that she cooks as a way of sharing. Um, the third one is that I think um, on the part of as an African like myself, part of my advocacy is like advocating within Ghana that there should be more state policy that supports this relationship building. So last year we had a year of return. This year we are having beyond a year of return. And then the final thing is that I think we should all date each other. I think Africans and African-Americans should date each other because that would also go a long way of building the bond. So that is how I would um, um, sort of close it out. I have more things to say about trade, but I think me and Cecil can have that conversation later. Well, I, I, I did say action, so you 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 responded on the nose. <laughs> okay, Cecil, you're up. Next. I just want to say Kwame is single. I just want to put a shout out to the ladies out there. <laughs> no, Kwame is not single. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know what you were talking about. I'm sorry. I, I took that the wrong way, Kwame. I apologize. So anyway, the action at this point, uh, I, I would like to have this continued conversation, first of all. We can do a shared project. Uh, we can focus on a shared project on the continent and a shared pro uh, 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 project here domestically. And, and see if that is enough. If you have common interests and you identify a common problem that impacts both places, then that to me is, is a, just a logical next step. So I don't know, uh, we can talk about the work that we're doing uh, at UBF. Um, and, and I would most definitely love to support um, the work that you all are doing as individuals, as, as young folks here in Cleveland. So, and shout out to Global Cleveland and, and my friend Joe Simperman for all the, all the wonderful uh, knowledge that you all have produced and, and shared in this week. And it's just been a pleasure of mine to participate. Thank you. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you so much, Mordecai. Again, thank you to these wonderful panelists. It has been an amazing experience and I've learned so much and so many things have been popping into my mind. So we'll definitely continue this discussion. And a huge thank you to our sponsor. We could not have done it without you. And again, I encourage everyone who's attended to check out our sponsors list and support them in any way you can.
thank you all and have a great rest of your day. And be sure to check out our sister cities conference. So these, these kinds of conversations are continuing beyond this panel. So we have um, our sister city conference, at the, I think at the end, towards the end of this month. So please consider joining us for that as well. It's all virtual, interactive, and free. <laughs>